everyone. Um, me again, uh, more books. Um, we are heading into the kind of the Christmas big titles. And um, I've told you about some of them that'll be coming in. So we'll have a little bit of a, a whoosh through some of the ones I think I'm excited about. And I hope by uh, giving me a, giving, lending me your ears, you will um, also be excited by some of these as well. Now you've all, um, heard of the Richard Osman, the man who died twice, and it was the, the follow-up to the um, Thursday Murder Club, and um, it's another mystery in that series. David read this one and says, well, you know the way you get a first one in a series, and like it does, as it did last year, extremely well, um, one of those kind of cozy crime, lovely setting of being inside the retirement home, some very feisty, smart characters and, um, you know, murders, the whole lot all thrown in. Um, you, When you, you know that there's a second one coming out, your brain sort of says, yeah, I wonder, you know, I wonder with an open mind whether, what that'll be like. And he says, oh, golly gosh, it is so good. If not, he's, if it's not better, he thinks, David thinks it's better that he's, it's like Osman has really found his stride um, with this one and is having a lot of fun. Um, great cast of characters, um, the same as number one. Um, and obviously, you know, you've got jewellery, high, um, is it smugglers? I'm not sure if you haven't read it, but there's, there's a bit of everything in there. Definitely murder, because where would the book be without it? Um, and what really stands out for him is how much you get through the reading of it, how Osman cares for and has this tenderness for every single one of his characters, who you will absolutely love. You're under orders, you have to love them. So that's um, first one up for today. This one as well, uh, that one comes to us from, um, that's Penguin, yeah, Viking. Another one, um, this one is from Heinemann, um, Hutchinson Heinemann, I should say. Um, Bewilderment Richard Price, you know about this one. I talked to you about this one. I've often talked to you about um, my enduring love for Richard Powers. Um, I think I gave you a fair amount. I was reading it the last time we had talked about it. And just to say, look, it's a splendid, splendid, splendid read. It's on the book of shortlist, um, well and truly up there. I think I slightly prefer the overstory because I love a very layered, um, very intricate story. And I was, of course, in, you know, grand great admiration for, um, well, I have a deep love of trees. <laughs> so this one is very slightly different. And I suppose in the long run, we're bringing it down to, um, do you hold the universe in your in your mind with your visions for it and, and the future of our planet? Or do you hold it in, which is what our main character, Theo, is very much cerebral about his universe and his son who holds the universe within his heart. Um, it's a very lovely book. It has that simplicity of um, the storyline is not as intricate. So I don't think it makes the story any less powerful, um, but very, very beautifully written um, and very short chapters because we're dealing with kind of astrophysics and imagination. So um, he doesn't he has, uh, he doesn't ramble on, oh, that's a bit rude of me, but he, he keeps it succinct, but there's just so much to explore, so much to think about. An absolutely beautiful book, poignant, um, a total winner. Um, from HarperCollins, we have this little one that I picked up um, because it's at the reading list, and I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I own a bookshop, I should, I should possibly find out what, what this one is all about. And before I knew it, I was on a page 100 and something and I said, okay, um, let's keep going. It's set in England and it is set in a lending, in a library. Lending library. A library. Um, and we have two main characters. Um, we have Alicia, who's a young woman who is doing a kind of a job in the library while she's waiting to make up her mind about university. And we have a recently widowed Indian gentleman called Mukesh, and he is father of three daughters, kind of, a little bit, not stereotype, but you've got a kind of a bossy one and a quiet one, and he's, they, they're they very much in touch with him, um, usually leaving him messages and telling him how to deal with being widowed, and he has a very lovely granddaughter who's terribly shy, and this is, there are these two characters, Alicia lives with a very unwell mother, um, who's sort of depressed and not easy, and an older brother. Um, and it's how 
Alicia finds this reading list, and this reading list has eight titles on it. And we go through the book following these titles, and they're big classics like Beloved, Pride and Prejudice, A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth, um, How to Kill a Mockingbird, I mean How to, To Kill a Mockingbird, um, the, Rebecca, um, that whole sort of classics, um, but it's how that classic literature addresses the the events of our, our life and you go through and that list actually ends up in a lot of our other characters because there, there's a there's a whole field of these characters um in their hands and they become interested in books and then it's how everybody kind of connects through reading through taking the books from the library there's a little bit of sadness there's some it's quite gritty so it never falls into that trap of being just kind of fluffy or we all love books and we're all going to love each other there's some real things and you have to I had to work a little bit at the beginning to get all my characters and to really kind of immerse myself in that immigrant Indian culture and I just loved it very very lovely read um, and I do highly recommend it it's, it's, it's a good one Next up is another one from Heinemann, Hutchison Heinemann, Heinemann, which is um, Lauren Groff from Fates and Furies, some of you might have read. Oh, this woman is the absolute, um, blew my head off, basically, historical fiction. Um, totally, totally, totally adore this book, and I'm, I'm anxious for everybody to read it, I think. It's very much a book about women, and it's a book about, um... oh, it's a book. It's a book about viragos. It's a book about a virago. It's very loosely based, or because we don't know an awful about its central character, um, Lauren Groff has had immense, um, she's taken sort of artistic license to work out who, or to decide who her Marie de France was. So Marie de France wrote these uh, lays, or sort of, um, you know, we, most of you will know what it is, but it's sort of like those songs um, and um, sort of you'd find troubadours or, or in this case Breton lays would, would have been stories that included some supernatural, some Celtic. And Marie de France wrote this series of, of Breton lays, um, 12 I think. And um, in real life or in fact there's very little known about who she might have been. All she says is my name is Marie and I'm from France. Um, we know that that character might have been in England, and we think she may have been an abbess either of Reading or of Ely or of Shaftesbury. Um, we start our story with a young woman on a plodding horse with her Merlin in its mew. Ah, oh, the vocabulary I learned. Um, you really are transported back into the 12th century. We're in England, and she has been sent from the court of Eleanor of Aquitaine or um, Yes, um, to, um, she's, 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 our main character, Marie, is a bastard child with some connection to no, nobility or royalty. Um, and it's never, she's very clever, she doesn't attribute very much to anything because, and that's part of the performance of what Marie de France is, we attribute a, an identity to her. And this is something that I think um, is being played with a lot. Um, and she's, anyway, she's sent by Eleanor, with whom she is passionately in love, um, to look after this or take over as prioress of a absolutely shambolic rundown monastery somewhere in England. Again, no place to mind. And it's about this larger than life person who didn't really believe in God. She thought it was all very twisted, although her family had been out on the Crusades. So she deals with male power, male violence a little bit, but it's mostly about female power because she's this huge, almost giantess. She's raw, she's kind of gauche, but she has this incredible ability to organize. Like she's almost mirror, sort of military in her, the way she finally um, stops sobbing about being dismissed like some dog from the court and has to take over this monastery. And it's about women together and it's quite funny in places. Um, it's about the women's frustrations, be they sexual or just living with each other. And it's about how the, this abbey goes from um, absolutely terrible poverty to to pulling itself together to um, actually becoming an important and wealthy um, enterprise. It's fantastic. Um, I was knocked sideways by the writing, knocked sideways by this total immersion in 12th century England. Go for it. It's 
It's a stunner. Um, I'll probably keep talking about that. And every time you come in, do you read historical fiction? Because if you don't start with this one. Gorgeous. Next one up is from Europa. This is Fresh Water for Flowers from Valérie Perrin. Um, and Valérie Perrin is a French writer who has been translated. And this book did come out last year in France. I'm back in France. I'm in a French thing. And I, um, I read it a couple of days ago, popped it down uh, over the long weekend. And oh, it's another, it's another gorgeous one. Now, this is one a little bit more perhaps feel good. Um, Though there are some elements in it that are, you know, to get a good story, bad things have to happen. Let us be realistic. Um, we have, um, this is a, um, a little sort of device or, or a little um, technique that some writers manage to capture beautifully, which is they, they contain their, their characters within a, within a sort of a physically confined area. And in this one, it's mostly set in the cemetery. Uh, which is not in any way lugubrious. It becomes a place of joy in this book, and for that alone, the book is worth reading. Um, also for the writing style, because it is quite unique. Um, we, I felt the book was constructed a little bit like a painting, where you get sort of layers of the story when you start with our main character, um, Violette Toussaint. And Violette is in, we start with her in the cemetery, and we love the cats, we love the dogs who mourn on the, the graves of their departed owners and she looks after them, she's wonderful. A wonderful garden, so it's about, there's a lot of this is about healing and about grief. And a detective, Julien, walks in and he is, they're, they're sort of in their 50s, 60s, and um, you're never too old to fall in love. You, I should know. Anyway, they, um, you don't know that that's going to happen, but that, well, you do know, you know very early that the, 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 we're being set up for, for this, but we're also looking into her her past, how come she's there, why is she living on her own, and the people in the cemetery who work with her, they're huge characters, she develops them all absolutely beautifully. There's a mystery, there is a sadness in it, um, and um, a little bit of uh, how a certain event, how a certain death occurred. She has had an abusive relationship, but you kind of, you, you, she very cleverly sends you off thinking, oh, were certain people this bad? And then you look at the way they've gone, gone back and done things. So she kind of relayers the story. Very clever. Lots of detail. Totally loved it. Um, and not in any way bleak uh, or over dramatic, nor frothy. It, she just gets that beautiful middle line of a smashing um, read that you don't want to put down. And because I love you all so much, and I love your children, if you know what I mean, and I know we all need to know what are our Christmas presents going to be this year, I will be showing you every now and then a middle fiction book. I actually read this one and it's worth reading no matter what age you are. It is one of those lyrically beautiful, I love the word lyrically, don't I? But it's kind of otherworldly without being a magic um, book necessarily. We have, oh, I've galloped ahead of myself. See, I know this all off by heart because I love these all so much. This one comes to us from Alan and Unwin. It is a middle grade, but you could you can read it up to you know, 120, if that's how old you live. Um, we have a little girl, Pip, um, and very early on you realise that she's, there are two sorrows in her life. One is that her mother has a boyfriend who is um, not the nicest person in the world and she's learned to become very small and very quiet um, because he can be set off, um, which is a difficult thing. And you also realise that she's, she's had a great friendship and that that, friendship with Mika has um, ended, he has gone away. And she mourns his um, his going. And then one day she finds this very, she thinks it's a little bird and it turns out when she looks at her properly it's a dragon and it's very, very small and she calls it Little Fella. And as we go through the book we realise that she has to kind of figure out what to feed it. And she has to figure out um, what she's going to do with it and how she can hide it from people. And of course, she doesn't manage to hide it from some of her, you can imagine, children of that age in the classroom. They know something funny is going on because she brings it to school. Of course she does, in her school life. And the most unlikely other friendships occur, a young girl, Laura, in her class, who's a little bit more the sort of, you know, from the wealthier part of town um, into the ballet and the ribbons and the stuff, but actually Laura is the one who will sort of heal this dragon and make its wings better so it can fly. And then another boy who will come into our story, Archie, who's who might be um, 
able to solve other problems. I'm not going to tell you too much about it, just know that it's one of those very, and Foxley does this, she, she did A Most Magical Girl and then she did Lenny's Book of Everything and these were stories where she gets right to the heart of children's um, outlook in the world and the things that might worry or trouble them and then she writes them down on the page so that we can all have a look at those and see how these things can be solved. In this one we are looking at grief, we are looking at being able to let go of, of uh, the things that hold us back um, but we are looking also at how together in, in, in groups or with the help of someone we can overcome obstacles. It is um, just sprinkled with that un, unworldliness but we're in the real world and of course as adults and read, reading it we know that it's, the dragon is a metaphor for the self I can become but oh my goodness it was so lovely. That's it, I'm going to stop talking now, I'm only going to, I'm only going to let you know that you can ring me up and you can order it, all or any of those. There is a, um, an amount of books that I can't even begin, we are tidal waved with books and a lot of them are, um, I, I actually don't have time to read them all and I'm actually almost sick because I want to read them all. So know that whatever I'm going to be putting in front of you, you're going to be given a, you're going to be spoiled for choice. And of course you deserve it. Um, we're having a not the best year and I'm hoping that we can make up for this by being able to give you some absolutely stunning books. Um, leading up to Christmas and including. So um, look out for more reviews because there will be there will be more. And um, until then, look after yourselves and we miss you and we hope, we can't wait to have you all back in the shop as soon as possible. But until then, let me know if you want anything and recommendations, all of that. Bye bye. <laughs>